Welcome to Crypto Disrupted. I'm your host, Trent Lipinski, and I am here with Regen Network, and I'm here with Christian and Aaron. Christian, can you tell us a bit about who you are and what you're working on? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Trent. It's great to be on. My name is Christian Shearer. I'm, uh, I'm the CEO of Regen Network. Um, I've been working in ecological agriculture for the past 15 years or so. Out of college, I, I kind of herded a group of people who are interested in starting a, a permaculture design education center in northern Thailand, and I lived there for six years working with various people who are interested in um, redesigning their own lives, building their own homes, and working on uh, ecological agriculture stuff. Uh, from there, I ended up forming a company called Terra Genesis International with a few other uh, ecological agriculture folks. And we started out doing ecological design and have since shifted more towards working with natural products companies uh, on their supply. And a lot of these companies are companies that already have 100% organic supply, work in fair trade, but they want to be doing better than that. So our company works with them on trying to figure out how to invest into shifting systems in a way that we can even do better than organic. So that's where I'm coming from. And we also have on our call with us our chief uh, technology officer, Aaron Kralius. So I'll pass it over to Aaron. Cool. Thanks, Christian. Um, so uh, my background is in uh, software engineering. <clears throat> I've um, been writing software for, I mean, quite a long time, I guess, since I was a, was a kid. Um, and most recently, I've been working uh, with functional programming. So I write Haskell, um, have been working with Clojure for a number of years. And before that, I worked with um, more object-oriented languages, uh, C++, C Sharp. I did a bit of embedded and FPGA work mixed in there. So I have kind of a pretty broad background in um, software. Uh, and you know, with Regen, I'm uh, looking at both the big picture and also uh, you know, writing some of the code for the blockchain implementation itself. Uh, I've also been interested in permaculture um, and uh, ecology, uh, regenerative agriculture for quite a long time. Um, and I actually first met the, the CEO of, of Region Network, Gregory Landway, who's not here, um, maybe about 10 years ago. And we kind of geeked out on the whole idea of doing some of the integrated permaculture and technology. And now it's uh, finally happening with Region Network. Awesome. So can you guys kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, what the Regen Network is and what you're trying to accomplish? Because it sounds like, you know, and maybe kind of start with the problem that you're trying to solve. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd love to do that. So, yeah, I think we need to zoom out a little bit before we talk about Regen Network in particular and talk about the kind of the global context that this project fits so well into. Um, I've been describing a little bit like a, a Rubik's Cube. Like there, we have these in, immense challenges right now on this planet, including climate change and poverty stuff and relocation to refugees and the desertification of, you know, in Africa and the Middle East and even here in the United States, it's happening more and more. Um, at the same time, we have the, the, our, the current generation that's coming up saying, we're willing to pay more for, for better products. And we have this huge, um, uh, like group of brands and companies that are willing and excited to actually contribute to making the world a better place. You know, they're kind of seeing that, that our government and maybe even most governments aren't really stepping up in the way that they really need to, to solve these problems. And so, um, so the way that I see it is all the colors are there on that Rubik's cube, you know, it's all mixed up and we need mm -hmm. to figure out how to, how to put them together. And a few of those colors that have just shown up recently have to do with emerging technologies, including uh, distributed ledger technology and the advances in remote sensing and satellite technology and IoT. And what we're doing at Regen Network is trying to bring those together to help solve some of our you know, planetary, biological, ecological challenges. Um, so one of the things that I think that most people don't realize in the conversation around climate change is that 
uh, is that our biological systems, our agricultural systems, are actually one of our greatest hopes in terms of solving this, this huge challenge that's out in front of us. You know, oftentimes the, the story is kind of framed in a way that, uh, you know, the big corporations need to get more efficient with their factories and our cars need to get more miles per gallon and need to shift to electric and all of our light bulbs need to be more efficient. But what, what that is actually talking about is reduction in emissions from their current levels, which is really important. We need to do better on that. But right now, the, um, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere sits at just above 408 parts per million. The United Nations had already established that 350 parts per million was kind of the, the threshold at which we need to stay there or below. So at this point, it's not that we need to be putting less carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's that we need to be pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and getting it back somehow back into the ground or into living systems. Um, and so that story of climate change is one of the big issues that TerraGen or that Regen Network is is focused on. But really, planetary regeneration in general, you know, working on cleaning our rivers, cleaning up our oceans, uh, uh, reestablishing healthy uh, ecological systems from forests to reefs to to um, wetlands, and and kind of primarily focused on our agricultural systems. You know, Would terraforming be a good example of, of what kind of you're going for? Is This is more about terraforming the planet to be more ecologically sound, essentially, um, and using technology in a way to kind of augment that to be able to track these different things. Is that kind of the direction? Sure, sure, cool. I, I mean, I, I like that concept. The, the one big shift from the concept of terraforming in the way that I think about it is that this isn't a big centralized, like uh, government dominated effort to make these changes. If we can do this the way that we think that we can, uh, by using, by really understanding what's happening on particular pieces of land around the planet, and creating the right incentive structures through smart contracts on our blockchain system, we can invite people all over the world to contribute in their own way to do this global terraforming, right? Mm -hmm. So even a small farmer in Southern Mexico who has an acre and a half and he's growing corn <clears throat> may uh, see that through, through a network of farmers and the cooperative that he's connected to might find out that there are contracts written to upgrade the way that they're farming and that he is invited into a process to, to shift his practices. Regen Network is then verifying the outcomes that he's achieving, and he'll receive those rewards. Those rewards might have been from the Mexican government to help achieve their climate accord commitments. They might have been from a corporation who's buying this, some, of their, some of their corn from their, this farmer, or it might have been from just you or I who said, you know what, I would love to put a small bounty up onto this system saying anyone that's located in the country of Mexico who is interested in shifting from chemical agriculture to non-chemical agriculture, you'll receive this amount of reward per acre. Um, that's what we hope to see so that, so that the 400 to 500 mil, million smallholder farmers on this planet could be, could be the key players in, in really doing the terraforming that you're talking about. Okay, interesting. And what, uh, so, it, you know, another component of this is, is actually oxygen generation as well. Um, you know, so I, I was just reading an article the other day about how the, the ocean itself is actually losing a lot, of its, uh, it, a lot of its oxygen and that's starting to have an impact on the, the life in the oceans. And then because we have so much carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, our, our oxygen levels are actually decreasing as well. So the, thing that all life on this planet actually depends on, which is oxygen, uh, you know, is going away because we're cutting down our forests, we're, you know, we're eliminating the things that actually produce oxygen. So it sounds like your solution would actually generate more oxygen and actually start to recycle some of this, you know, carbon dioxide and some of this bad air. Yeah, totally. Yeah, totally. What's, what's really amazing about this planet is that that uh, we're working with natural systems that just naturally want to regenerate themselves. So, you know, you can imagine, you know, a farmer who's out there plowing every year, he's 
plowed for 50 years in a row and just destroyed the soil. As soon as that farmer steps away from that, from that landscape and leaves it alone, regeneration starts to happen. You know, those, those weeds pop up and those little shrubs pop up and nitrogen comes back in the soil. It, the planet can do it, do, it, do it on its own. And eventually the planet would heal itself and get the oxygen back to the level that, that we would um, prefer and get everything balanced out and, and life would continue. There's a unique place for humans to help out in this system. You know, as or more, we can be as uh, productive and helpful for the, the ecological systems on this planet as we have been destructive. In fact, I would think that we could actually be more because the planet will work with us in those ways. So um, when it, coming back to the oxygen that you were talking about, even if a, one of our protocols is focused on clean water, or one of our pr protocols is focused on biodiversity, because all of these things are interconnected, I would actually expect to see oxygen levels actually move in, a, in the correct direction as well. So we don't have protocols specifically written about, about oxygen, but, but because, you know, because ecological systems are just so tied together in this way, um, we would expect to see, you know, to find a balance that we're after. And, yeah, it's and a we could. Yeah, I mean, we, we could have protocols specifically about oxygen. I mean, the, the sort of underlying idea is that we're creating a framework by which it will be easier to aggregate the data from satellites, from uh, sensors on the ground, and, and look at any sort of outcome that we want to look at. So, you know, somebody could theoretically look at oxygen and create a contract around that. And that's sort of the platform that we're, we're hoping to create with, with this project. Yeah, that's right. So, Let's get a little deeper into what the technology, what the solutions are for this. So you've mentioned satellites, we've mentioned blockchain. Um, so Aaron, can you kind of go a little bit deeper into, you know, what all the tech is that you're evaluating right now and what the solution kind of looks like on a technical level? Yeah, I can give that a try. And uh, it's, I mean, there's, there's quite a lot. Um, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a pretty, I think it's, I think it's, fair to say it's a pretty ambitious project to sort of bring all these pieces together. Um, but on the, on the verification side of things, um, I think first and foremost, we're looking at satellite imagery because that imagery is publicly available and, you know, we can tell with a reasonable degree of certainty that it's, it was, you know, collected with the, you know, without any sort of ulterior motives to sort of game the system or, um, yeah. trick the satellites, you know, we, we can more or less trust it. We can correlate it with weather data, uh, see when there was cloud cover. So, you know, publicly available satellite data and weather data is sort of um, the first starting point. Uh, the next starting point I'm seeing is maybe drone imagery, uh, LIDAR, that maybe you could have a community that uh, invests in having sort of a, a drone that shared that kind of does mapping of the uh, landscape and, and, and provides insight into what's happening on the ground. And then the next level would be IoT sensors that are installed on site to um, measure soil moisture, temperature, humidity, you know, lots of other things. And then different types of, um, you know, soil tests, different, um, there are people talking about like soil, specifically designed soil cameras that are uh, low cost that can kind of look at what's happening in the soil. So there's whole range of technologies that we're looking at on the sort of monitoring side of things. Um, and then- And can I, can I add in there that, that one of our points with creating this kind of open uh, set of protocols for this is that there's no one right way to do this. You know, you might set a smart contract with, with somebody that you know down the road. And mm -hmm. for you, the data, the, the only piece of data that you require is that they said that they did that thing. And, yeah. And so you could write your protocol in a way that says, you know, we will pay out this contract as soon as this guy says that he did this. You know, for most people, that wouldn't be enough data to really verify that that happened. But in a case where you have that much trust with, with this person, you could write a protocol like that. Now, you know, as we're considering having governments and corporations and others being some of the, the primary user groups of our, of our platform, we want to have the, the the, our protocols built in such a way that we could have a, a range from, from that very trusted use case model of one-on-one -on -one relationships up to a place where you 
feel very certain with a high degree of certainty that the data coming in is accurate, it's trusted, and that it's sufficient to make the, uh, to make the claims that we're making. That's where I'm guessing the blockchain really comes into play here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in, on, the, on the blockchain side of things, um, so we're actually launching our own blockchain. Um, and that was some, a decision that we made after a lot of deliberation, um, looking at the available solutions, looking at the way that uh, things are currently set up in the landscape and the sort of computational needs, uh, the desire to limit energy consumption and have fairly high compute capacity that is uh, either on chain or close to chain is one thing we've been saying. Um, so we're using, uh, I'm sure if you're familiar with Tendermint, but it's the consensus engine that is built by the Cosmos team. Uh, so the Cosmos team vision um, is to have, you know, multiple, you know, blockchains, which they call zones that interact with each other and where they can pass coins between the blockchains. And, you know, the blockchains themselves can be more specifically focused on, on specific domains. Um, and so we're looking at, you know, what we're calling a domain specific blockchain uh, with its own smart contracting framework, uh, which I'm working on, which is its own sort of really involved um, topic. And I could go into that if, 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 if you like. Um, is this similar to like proof of stake in a consensus model or is this a different consensus model? Are you okay? Working, yeah, so our consensus, is this more like proof of reward or? The consensus model that we're, we're using right now is basically a consortium model. Uh, so it's, you know, and we went through many different iterations to figure out exactly what we were gonna use. And at one point we were thinking we would do proof of stake. But if you go down the route of proof of stake, then you end up with the situation where the people who hold the tokens are basically the ones who govern the network. And there's a whole lot of other, other issues that can come up there. And those stakeholders are not necessarily the one, the, they're not necessarily the farmers. They're not necessarily the people that are um, working on, uh, you know, regenerative agriculture, like on, on the science side of it. They're, they're not necessarily, it, you know, we don't necessarily know who, who the token holders are going to be in this sort of system. Um, and so then next we tried to look at various reputation systems. Well, can we, um, can we sort of measure the positive impact that an actor is having in, in the system by, uh, like a farmer, for instance, by doing regenerative agriculture or, um, you know, people that are contributing, that are funding those projects. And that's, that's an avenue that I think we were, we were, we find it very interesting that, that idea, but as we play, as we played out the different scenarios, um, you know, the, the challenge that you run into there, there is that when you have a reputation system that you like, if we create a reputation system that we haven't actually tested in the field, yeah then there's a whole set of variables that we don't necessarily, that might be exist that we don't know about. There's things we can't predict. And we can try our best to predict them, but there is this factor that there, you know, we, there is some way that we're introducing a factor that somebody could come in the system and try to find a way to get more points than other people and have more governance power and shift influence, shift the system in a, in a different direction. So I think the reputation model is something that we're, interested in exploring and possibly adding into different parts of a governance model as the system evolves. But the governance model that we're starting with is a consortium based governance model where basically uh, we're, we're, as we're going and we're developing this project, we're going to conferences and we're meeting tons and tons of organizations working in these spaces. Mm -hmm. And we want to get them engaged in our project. Well, for us, it seems like one of the best ways to do that is to invite them to be a member of the consortium. And basically to be a uh, member of the consortium, you have to have an organization and you have to basically agree to the principles that we're going for. And then you'll get one seat, one vote on a validator merit. So in, in the Tendermint model, there's a, a fixed set of validators. Each validator knows the, the, the public key of the other validators that are there. And there's a two thirds consensus of all the validator power to move forward with consent. So it could be used for a staking model and Cosmos is using it with a staking model. Um, we, you know, we could have chosen to go with a staking model. We, and, you know, we could, 
um, have chosen to go with the reputation model and that's something we could shift to hard fork to later. But for now, the simplest model seems to basically be, well, you have one, you know, one organization, one vote. And the logic there is that there's, we want to encourage productive discourse in the, in the community. And we want people to, to exert influence by having strong arguments as opposed to having more points. Got it. So that's sort of the logic that we went down. You know, people are going to have, there's going to be differences in reputation that's social. And yeah. we want people to really engage in the social process of discussion and discourse. Now, in this space, I, I could understand where some people would say, well, that, you know, that model is maybe, you know, it's not using as much of the sort of game theory as other models. It's, a, it's sort of a design choice that we looked at, you know, and, and, and it's the choice we made. And, and I guess we'll see how, you know, it plays out. Um, you can yeah, always I mean, pivot later, right? If you need to. That's kind of the beauty of some of these consensus models and, you know, governance and all that is if you need to improve upon it later, you can. Yeah. Yeah. And what one of the things that I want to add in here to this is that one of the benefits of this model is that it gets like trusted actors in the space to lean in and get excited about the project. Mm -hmm. So so Aaron was just talking about the technical requirements and how that like functionally works. And now coming from a social like network building perspective, it's also very exciting that we have this uh, consortium model. Uh, we're not really ready yet to announce the folks that are the beginning consortium members in our project, but we've gotten a lot of excitement and interest in leaning, in, leaning into this. From some of our existing uh, client base in the uh, natural products industry, as well as from lots of nonprofits and environmentally focused groups. And so having them realize like, wow, I'm actually kind of like one of the owners of this blockchain and this project it really builds some will in to them to really lean in and try to understand it more fully and see how they could participate. So I think it's really a good choice to begin with for on a number of different levels. Yeah, it sounds like it creates kind of a, a you know, a team effort here. Um, and it, you're also providing this almost as a tool as well. So, you know, they're going to be able to get onto the Regen network you know, they're gonna now be able to leverage the blockchain and blockchain technology, and they're now gonna be able to leverage all these other technologies that connect to the network you're building. So mm -hmm. it definitely, I mean, it's definitely, uh, you know, this is gonna benefit a lot of farmers, a lot of people in the space. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's also fascinating how you wanna integrate, you know, with satellites and drones and also on the IoT side, because that's where you can also collect some of the data um, which then you can do a later analysis on. Um, so that'll give you more insight on how to be more effective in the future and then pass some of that data back to the other members of the, of, you know, of the group you're putting together. So now you'll actually be able to kind of crowdsource your own answers. That's right. It's like, it's kind of like a self, self fulfilling uh, process, you know? Yeah. I mean, obviously some of our MVPs that we start out with are probably going to be pretty simple protocols, you know? Mm -hmm. um, well, actually to get into a little bit, it's trying to actually measure the sequestration of carbon using a remote sensing is very difficult or maybe impossible, or I don't know if it's impossible, but uh, you, you would have to you use a other lot branch. more. Yeah, you need more ground truth, that's right. So, so if we start with some more simple ecological protocols, like one of the ones that I've been imagining starting with is just a, basically a, a verification of no-till agriculture, you know, which is very easy to do from, from remote sensing, from satellite data. You know, did this farmer till or did they not till? It's actually a really relevant uh, question in the regenerative agriculture space right now because the movement to try to shift farmers away from a highly degradatory uh, agricultural system towards a more regenerative agriculture system often starts with like the reduction in plowing. Um, so we can start that, we'll learn some information, we'll, we'll, we'll gather data about it, we'll learn a lot about it, and over time we start to see, huh, interesting, I'm learning this, so we could upgrade our protocol to get better and better. And through this open source, like, um, you know, inviting the scientific community, inviting the academic community to participate. We just constantly iterate and improve on a wide, on a wide range of, of protocols. Yeah. And, and so one thing I, I just want to say also about that, you know, that process of bringing the scientific community 
together. One thing that we've been seeing and, you know, that also kind of leads into this consortium model is as we're going and we're talking to different people working in the space, there's a lot of people trying to create those verification protocols, trying to look at, you know, measuring carbon sequestration, other types of uh, regenerative land use management practices. There's a lot of people in remote sensing. And how do you get them to come to the table and say, let's collaborate on things? So, you know, we're hoping that a lot of the a lot of the groundwork in science for building these things will actually come from existing organizations that we then invite to join the consortium and then you know then they already have a team and there's some there's a few that we're talking with right now i mean i don't want to mention them but they have you know pretty large teams and they've been in this space for quite a while and they're pretty excited about you know using blockchain technology and we're you know the challenge there's presenting a business model how do they still you know have a funding source and make money um, mm -hmm. while they're kind of open sourcing their work. And I think that's a lot of what we're doing. Uh, like our eco economic model is to sort of make it so that they, they can be open and they can have everything open source and they can also have funding come, uh, you know, through the system in terms of transaction fees that, you know, might be, um, you know, small percentage that's taken when there's money that's rewarded that our tokens are rewarded for verification. So there's this kind of economic model that. No, I, I, I think what's really interesting about what you guys are trying to do is, you know, you're, you're creating, you know, you're kind of looking at this from the aspect of let's build this network. And then that network can be leveraged, you know, by farmers, by these IOT companies. So there's dozens, if not hundreds of different business models that could leverage what you're building. So it doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a nonprofit if you want to use your system. Uh, you know, you could use your system and still be a for-profit entity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and you could still have crops that you're selling, and you could still mm -hmm. have, you know, there could still be some capitalism in the mix. Um, so that's that's fat. That's kind of a fascinating approach because you know, totally system. Trent, we, yeah, the uh, one of the one example of exactly what you're talking about is we were approached when we were at, when we were at DevCon three. We were approached by a group called EtherRisk which is a uh, Ethereum contract based insurance company. Uh, and, and we've actually had conversations with reinsurance companies as well on a much larger scale. Um, and so EtherRisk offers a crop insurance uh, uh, product to their, you know, to whoever wants to sign up for it. It's much, much, much more straightforward than a traditional crop insurance uh, contract where you know when your crop is wiped out then you have to like fill out all this paperwork and like make sure that you actually um that you actually can receive these benefits whereas an ethereum based smart contract around crop insurance basically basically says if these data points say x y or z then your your the contract gets paid and they approached us and said right now our contracts are based on really generalized weather data you know, it doesn't actually have anything to do with that person's particular piece of land. So if you guys could set up a network that actually could verify the ecological state of what's happening on a particular piece of land, that would make our job so much more refined and clear, which means that we could probably drop the price of our, of our crop insurance for these folks and they'd be getting a better product that would actually pay them when they got damaged and not pay them when they don't. So... It's a very cool concept. And then go, zooming out from there, the whole reinsurance industry, which is the, it's basically the industry that insures the insurance companies, right? Uh, so if you think about something like Dallas, Texas, having you know, the amount of floods that it had this last year and the amount of claims that were made to insurance companies, the reinsurance companies took a huge hit, you know? They, so, the cool thing about reinsurance is that they are actually incentivized to invest into systemic change. If, if a reinsurance company can invest into some sort of systemic change that actually reduces the amount of total insurance claims happening, then they make more money. So, so take Dallas, for example. How could we incentivize less flooding around Dallas? So, okay, let's, let's think about this from a biological systems perspective and ecological agriculture perspective. If you build more topsoil on one acre of, farm, uh, of, of ground, that ground for every percent increase in organic, soil, or, organic carbon in the soil, 
you can hold 50,000 more gallons of water in that soil. So this, so that's in one acre. You know, there's hundreds of thousands of acres in the watershed around Dallas. Uh, this reinsurance company could put smart contracts up on Regen Network saying for any farmer in this watershed who has been verified to have built topsoil, we'll pay you whatever amount, I don't know what it is, $100 per acre for every 1% increase in organic matter. You know, and that improves their business model by doing that. So, and, and it also sequesters carbon. <laughs> right. And also it creates more fertile ground and also creates higher nutrition food being grown out of those farms. It's like a win, 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 win when you start doing this. It's awesome. Yeah, it's and, very and cool. So tell me a little bit more about your structure, you know, where you guys are at, you know, kind of on a, as a business, um, you know, what, <clears throat> what kind of organization is this? Are you guys doing an ICO? Um, you know, what are you looking to raise? What, where are you at right now? Sure. Um, we uh, explored, you know, in the early in the early days of this, explored all our op options about legal structures. Explored doing a Swiss foundation and having an offshore entity that you know has all these interesting relationships. In the end, we decided to come back to where most of us are based, which is right here in the United States. And we really wanted to do this whole thing through a five hundred one c three nonprofit. You know, our mm -hmm. goal out of this is not a quick buck in our pocket. You know, our goal about, about out of this is planetary regeneration. We wanna have a planet here for our kids and our grandkids. You know, and the model that we think makes the most sense for that is running it through a 501c3 that's very uh, open books and transparent about all of our operations. Uh, in the end, after working with our law firm on this, they recommended to us that we actually run the token sale through a for-profit entity um, and so we're currently actually, as of just last week, you know, starting beginning of May, uh, we launched a kind of a soft launch for our token sale, private, private, um, private placement, SAFT agreements, you know, um, it's all reg D securities laws to make sure that we're, we're not sure that this is a security, but we, we are sure that the SAFT is, a, is a security because the SAFT is offering future tokens. So trying to stay above the law, trying to stay very transparent and clear about everything we're doing. Uh, in our first round of fundraising, we're aiming to, aiming to raise $5 million. Uh, that $5 million will then give us a, a runway to really be really pushing on the development side of things. You know, add a number of developers to Aaron's team, be pushing the uh, development of the blockchain and the uh, ecological contracting frameworks and the, uh, and the language that we're using for this uh, project, as well as starting to make the partnerships that are really important. You know, connecting with those government agencies, corporations, and philanthropic efforts that, that, that see Regen Network as, a, as an important piece of infrastructure that they've kind of needed all along. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so at some point after the token sale is done, we're aiming to raise $40 million over the course of the next year or so for this project. When the token sale is done, We've wrapped up a, a, a couple contracts and things with the, with the for-profit. We're donating that entire for-profit entity to the nonprofit organization. So, you know, all the cash assets, the 40% of tokens will be remaining in the foundation's control for, for use over the long term. And the, all the intellectual property that's been developed up to that, up to that point will be put to the uh, foundation. And then the consortium, We'll go through a through a, a transitionary period where, over the course of five years or so, the the consortium of entities that are uh, governing the blockchain will actually have full control over the governance of the blockchain and selection of the board of directors for the foundation. So it'll be really will be owned by the community, not owned by some centralized group. Awesome. Aaron, I'd love for you to add to that. And, I'm doing the less technical sides of this, and yeah, is better. Um, no, I think that's pretty good. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm curious if Trent has any, you know, more specific questions or, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know. it, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating model because, uh, you know, I've been watching, you know, there's, there's kind of this gap right now where, you know, we have, uh, you know, what the blockchain enables you to do in terms of structures for corporations, especially when looking at these. 
essentially a decentralized organization is what you're you're building here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the legal framework for that doesn't exist yet. So, you know, we have the law, we have C corps, S corps, and all you know nonprofit organizations. But what happens when you're in the middle? What happens when you're kind of a nonprofit, but you're also kind of for profit? Uh, but then you're also this decentralized organization composed of dozens or hundreds of other corporations. So, um, you know, it's, you know, I think you're taking, you know, an interesting approach. Um, you know, I've looked at a couple different uh, companies in this space as well. And, you know, I think uh, the nonprofit, uh, using a nonprofit as kind of the foundation to own some of the intellectual property and possibly even own the, the blockchain itself makes the most sense. Um, especially for your use case. I mean, if you were doing something else that was, you know, clearly just for profit, then that'd be a different story. But in this mm -hmm. case, uh, you know, having the intellectual property owned by a nonprofit kind of allows you to have more of a decentralized system, both legally and functionally on the software side. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a fascinating model. Um, I think it's also interesting that you're starting with the for-profit and then you're going to donate it to the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Kind of allows you to skirt some of those initial issues of setting up the nonprofit first, which you know nonprofits are not easy to set up. Um, there's a lot of regulations; you have to go through a whole process uh, depending upon the state and you know where you are. But um, so it's a you know it's a it's a good model, um, especially for being able to secure and maintain the intellectual property of the blockchain and the technology itself so that you're making sure that, you know, one of your partners doesn't, you know, that's a for-profit entity, even if they end up being a billion dollar industry, doesn't completely control and dominate the technology. Um, it still enables that small farmer uh, to, you know, still have access to the technology, not have to pay premiums on licensing fees or, you know, any of the stuff that we currently kind of see with our current legal structures and our current systems. Um, this will allow for that kind of transparency and allow everyone from that small business owner all the way up to the enterprise to be able to leverage the system. Uh, and still, everyone kind of has their own vote and say. Um, That's right. So, That's right. You know, yeah, well, you know, one of the, one of the metaphors of, one of the metaphors I've liked, which is, I think is kind of what you're pointing out here, is that we're, we're building a piece of infrastructure. You know, it's, it's kind of like building a highway that, um, you know, no individual entity could build, but it's really important that we have that highway going from our town to the beach so that everyone can, you know, get to the beach and be able to swim. And, and so what we're inviting, we're inviting you, the, the listeners of this program, and we're inviting um, uh, companies and, and foundations and other projects that are interested in being involved in this is let's, let's chip in together on this important piece of infrastructure. And we're going to do the best we can to take the first steps on it and get it rolling and really facilitate the, the, the conversation around what it means to create the, the proper ecological, um, ecological state protocols, how it is to write the, the right ecological contracts and how to govern a blockchain in the right way. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff is going to get open sourced and just offered out there to the community. And, and anyone is invited either to, to use it either through Regen Network's platform or to, or to fork something that we've made and, and improve on it if, if you think you can. And then you could still use our blockchain to run your protocols. Where if, you know, if we can get to planetary regeneration through this one way or another, then, then we've won. Yeah. And you know, there, this model is not, you know, this has been done before, previous to blockchain technology. I mean, obviously there's a new element with the decentralization of it, but uh, WordPress is actually a really good example. So they have a nonprofit organization that actually owns the WordPress trademark, and then they run all of their events. Their their uh, they call them WordCamps. They're kind of the events that they have all over the world, um, and those are actually run through their nonprofit. Those are not hmm. run through a for-profit entity. Um, so you know, other open source projects have used nonprofits in this way before. Um, there's Linux operating systems that have done similar things where some of the code is actually owned by the nonprofit. And then there's a for-profit entity that then sells services on top of that, you know, nonprofit code. So hmm. these models have been explored in the past. So there's definitely, um, there's definitely a history of using different legal organizations for different purposes. 
And then, of course, again, there's this new wrinkle of how do you do this with these decentralized organizations? So you guys are kind of at the forefront of that um, to be able to figure out, you know, what, what does that look like using the existing legal frameworks that are available today? And then mm. you're essentially creating the future of what those frameworks look like with smart contracts, you know, moving forward. So, you know, it's definitely, uh, you know, you definitely have an ambitious project ahead of you, but, uh, you know, definitely something that can benefit the world. Totally. Cool. We've been told, it's, um, oh, go ahead, Aaron. No, no, um, go ahead, Chris. I was just, I was just going to ask Trent if he had any more specific questions for me technically, but, but go, go. Um. Yeah. Well, uh, I was just going to say, we've definitely been told that this is a very ambitious project and it is, I mean, it's, it's so much, uh, land base. I mean, we, we, it's unlike a lot of other, um, blockchain projects in that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, identity verification is very important. Like we have to know who it is that's actually doing these things on the land. You know, land tenure is very important. That's different in every country. Um, you know, these ecological state protocols, even if you talk about how do you measure biodiversity, you know, create a protocol around that. I mean, it's going to be different here in the Tetons where I live, you know, it's 6,500 feet up on the mountains than it is going to be in Texas or than it is going to be in Ecuador. Um, so, I mean, ultimately this has to be an effort that brings a large community of, of contributors together. Um, what the last thing I would want us to be portraying is that, that we, the small group of people that's creating region network, are in some way pretending that we have all the answers and that we're going to come up with the answers. That's definitely not the case. The case is what we believe is that we can facilitate a process of bringing the right players into the conversation and create a set of incentives that then drives a, a global movement towards figuring out what these proper protocols are and, and who would like to help fund those things happening in the world. Now, that I believe we can do. And you're building yeah. a system that while they're funding it, they're, they're helping both themselves and everyone else who's a part of the network. So you get kind of that collective effort. And then the data as well is going to be critical and useful for being able to share that data between users and, you know, other members of the network. So you can go see, hey, you know, this farm is, you know, successfully accomplishing these yields and, you know, they're successfully accomplishing these goals you know, what is their method? What is the data say, you know, what techniques are they using that I'm not using on my farm or my land? Uh, how can I get those same kinds of yields? How can I achieve those same kinds of goals? So once you get yeah. transparency to that kind of data, now you're, you're creating almost a knowledge base of, you know, how to do this. Um, totally. And, and learning uh, from each other. Trent, yeah. you're hitting on a, You're hitting on a huge important point that we haven't really touched. I mean, there's so many added benefits to this. Somebody might come back and say, yeah, but there's tons of agricultural data out there. And you know what that agricultural data is all about? It's all about Monsanto's business model. You know, yeah. it's all about Bionics. chemical agriculture, large plowing systems, you know, the, the, the green revolution style of agriculture. Mm -hmm. There isn't very much money out there funding the collection of data that has to do with ecological agriculture techniques. And, you know, study after study shows us that when farmers transition to ecological agriculture, not only do they make better profits per acre than the other system, but they actually have, can, can produce higher, um, higher outputs. There's a, there's a two or three year dip when the, like the land has, is in a bit of a, is, is still like transitioning from being chemical, um, chemical focus back to organic and a living system. But then after that, if, if they apply the right um, processes and techniques, People can get higher yields than, than in the chemical system. Uh, why, are every, why is everyone still using conventional agriculture and chemical agriculture? There's just way more money in it for the big players. You know, yeah. Dow and Monsanto and, you know, throw the U.S. government in there because they're just, you know, tied in with this whole system. They, they subsidize corn and soy, you know, to the hilt like crazy. Um, I, I believe what you're getting at here is such a big, important point that the data that's going to be coming out of Region Network is going to be building a, a knowledge commons that we can offer to the world's farmers to show them, look, here's the, here's the science behind the fact that ecological agriculture is going to be better for you, 
your families, your communities, and the world as a whole. Yep, and that's huge. Um, that'll it, that'll change things. Uh, yeah. And like I said, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you know this is going to kill profits. Um, you know, as you said, you know, there may be a little dip initially once the land has to kind of regenerate itself. But once it does, then you can actually increase your yields um, mm -hmm. and also help the planet at the same time and help your local community. So, yeah. you know, the benefits of, you know, ecological agriculture are, it's just plain as day. And we've seen yeah. the side effects of, you know, of big agriculture and, you know, the systems that we have today and the food that's being produced. I mean, uh, you know, the rates of diabetes, uh, obesity, and all the health problems that, you know, the United States in particular is facing and, you know, many third world countries are now starting to face as well. Uh, it's a result of what we're eating and totally. you know, ultimately switching people over to a more, you know, organic and healthy diet uh, where they're eating foods that, you know, have more nutrition and have more health benefits. Um, I mean, people are going to live longer and be healthier and happier and they'll have less health problems from, you know, essentially the system that you're trying to create. So there's a, so you're not just talking about regenerating the planet. You're also talking about regenerating the human population uh, totally. because this is going to provide a food source that's going to have a higher nutritional value than the crap that we're eating today. Um, that's right. So, so there's a, you know, there's an added benefit here where it's, we're not just saving the planet, we're saving the human population essentially from themselves. That's right, that's right. So yeah. any final thoughts before we wrap up, guys? Aaron, um, do you? Well, um, yeah, I was, I, was, um, I was thinking there was gonna be a lot more sort of technical questions uh, <laughs> you know, directed at, at me and I-, I No and, worries. Uh, and uh, since- You know, you know I think- we dove into it, you know, I, you know, I want the audience to really like understand the use cases here. So, you know, we can yeah. go a lot more technical, obviously, but, um, you know, I think, I think so far what we've kind of gotten is a good, you know, a good macro picture of where you guys are going, because I think on the micro side with the tech, um, there's a lot, uh, there's a lot of variables and there's a lot of stuff that you, you're still going to be figuring out and that's mm -hmm. totally normal and natural and that's part of you know being on the edge of an emerging technology like this so um you know is there something any, particular that you're you that you yeah, excited to on. share aaron I, I think i would i would basically just say you know there's a lot of stuff that we're talking about and it's a complex um complex set of problems and you know if you're curious you can check out we have it um in addition to our white paper and our sort of uh, token sale document or light paper we have system architecture document and a, a, a protocols document that goes over the scientific protocols. Um, you know, so there's, there's been a lot of, we think there, you know, there's been a lot of thinking that, you know, is that um, a lot of good thinking that's already happening in those areas. And um, yeah, I, I, and just that I'm happy to get into that in, you know, future conversations with people that are listening, want to know more and, um, yeah cool absolutely yeah i mean it's clear that what you guys are building is real you've done the research uh you know you're you're at the edge of this you know obviously with your background aaron like you know uh you know, you've you're clearly on the edge of this and you're you're gonna build a solution that uh you know makes sense so uh you know i you know i definitely love to read more of the white paper and see some of the more scientific stuff uh we could also you know, possibly do uh, another episode in the future uh, and dive a little deeper, you know, once you guys start to have more stuff built as well. Um, mm -hmm. And that's always an option. So totally, we could get our whole ecological state protocol team on the, on the call. <laughs> I mean, there's so there's so many different interesting aspects to this. We have multiple PhDs now working on remote sensing and working on the first iterations of the uh, ecological state protocols. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's really fascinating to learn about you know, how exactly satellite imagery, uh, how satellite data collects data and the different bands of data that come and how you can, you can infer things about photosynthetic activity, et cetera, from different bands. And I've, I've learned a ton through this. <laughs> so, Where can people find you? 
Yeah, please. I guess the call of action I would have for everyone on this call is, is a couple things. One is check out www.regen.network. That's our, our URL. Um, there's a lot of interesting information there. The, the papers that Aaron shared are fascinating. You know, our, our white paper started out at over 80 pages long, and so we needed to turn it into three different page, papers. So we got it a little bit more uh, succinct now, but now we also have a the tech paper and an ecological state protocol paper. So check those out. I would also encourage anybody that's listened and has thought, you know, my organization or my company might be interested in, in connecting with the consortium and being a part of this project. Um, we've had the, we've had the opportunity to really grow people's understanding of what blockchain is and what it, what it means for the world, grow the capacity of these companies to understand how they might be able to interact with it. And we would love to have a chat with you about, you know, joining into the consortium and being a part of the governance of this of this system. And then the last thing I'll say, of course, we are we do have a token sale open right now. It is it is only for folks that uh, that um, fit as accredited investors according to U.S. law. That doesn't mean that you actually have to have a certification from anywhere, but it does mean a certain a couple different bullet points. So yeah, you're the current net worth, et cetera. And I wish that we could open it up to everyone because I have a lot of friends who'd love to chip in 50 bucks, 100 bucks, but unfortunately US securities laws don't allow that. Um, but if you, you know, what I'd say is the people we're looking for for investors are people who are really interested in putting their assets, some of their assets behind uh, like ecological health in the world. You know, um, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't, I don't encourage you to go after this if you're just looking for a hundred time return on an ICO that's blasts through the roof at the, at the I think our token could do really well. I think it will do very well over time, but that's not our point. The, the investor community we'd like to build is one that really cares about the future of the planet. So, so consider, uh, consider reaching out to us in, in that regard. And and uh, I also want to say that uh, we have as our sort of public chat channel, we use Riot um, slash Matrix. And there's a link there on our regen.network website for the Riot channel. So you can just jump in there and reach out to us. Um, you know, we definitely welcome people to, to sort of volunteer their time. I actually know there's a number of people that did mention that. And um, we, if you're listening, we're definitely planning on looping you in just once we get a little more bandwidth um, in our in our schedule to kind of figure out how we can kind of integrate some of the community that's reached out to help out with developments. Um, there's also a Reddit that we started that has, isn't really super active yet, but um, I, you know, we're, we definitely welcome the community to come and, and chat with us and, um, you know, as as much as we can, we'll, we'll be monitoring those channels and, and, and responding as we, as we can. Totally. Again, it's with it's with the, all your help out there that we really make this the, the the full vision of what it can be. So cool. So we'd love to get your voice in there. Well, thank you guys for coming on the show. It's been amazing. I love the project and what you're working on and what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I think it can do a lot of good in the world. Thanks a lot, Trent. Thanks for having Thanks, us. Thanks, Trent. All right. Take care. All right. Take care. Have a great day.